let's start with the latest news on this attack, Israeli attack on Iran. And we've seen that Israelis said that within the next 48 hours, they're going to attack Iran. And, and after that, we see last night, we saw that they're attacking Iran with drones. I don't know, with <laughs> missiles, drones. How, how did you find this attack on Iran? There, there's something very strange going on here. Uh, whatever that was last night was not what I would call a credible attack. It was, um, it, at best, it was a symbolic effort, maybe a face-saving effort. Oh, yeah, we we attacked Iran back, so therefore we we don't have to retaliate anymore. Maybe, you know, maybe that was the intent. Because I am really struck by the divergence in the coverage of the so-called attack between what happened here in the United States. And I know what happened on like RT and inside Iran and on uh, Al Jazeera. I'd be curious what, you know, what the perception was in Brazil. But in the United States... Uh, you know, I was starting to write my you know daily piece for my blog, and I was focusing on the what I called the shift. I saw a shift in Israel's narrative yesterday. Uh, prior to uh, uh, Thursday, the Israeli narrative had been consistent with the West. With boy, we kicked some ass. You know, we we went out there. We got ninety nine percent of those Iranian drones. We shot them down. Hey. They were nothing. We major victory. Woo! Cheer, you know, get the cheerleaders out. And yesterday, all of a sudden, a shift. Uh, oh, they tried to target our nuclear facility at Demona, and they caused some damage. Now, <laughs> we've had, you know, today's the uh, 19th, so we'd had at least four days that they could have reported that, and they didn't come up with that till just yesterday. Oh, yeah, yeah, they, they tried to target our nuclear facility. So that's, you know, that's when I got my first hint of what I call cow manure. They don't just come up with that because uh, they they suddenly discovered it. They couldn't figure it out before. Uh, the, there's a purpose behind it. So uh, that's uh, that's number one. I In fact, when I saw that, I thought, they're laying a predicate that they will justify an attack on Iran's nuclear facilities. And one said it is Fahan. So as I'm writing this, you know, my son says, hey, there's breaking news. So now in the United States, we get what I call the breaking news mumbo. You know, the dance, you know, the dance to the right, dance to the left, shake it, shake it, shake it. You know, everybody's, oh my God, breaking news. We go to Jennifer Griffiths at the, uh, the Department of Defense and this, they're calling in this expert, that expert, uh, this retired general, that retired general. What does this mean? Oh, my God, this is the start of World War III. Israel, but then they said, limited strike. I'm going, that's a curious phrase, limited strike. That, <laughs> you know, uh, either you stri- I get punched or you don't get punched. If you're pulling your punches, that's a limited strike. So that's telling me right, right away there's, there's some punch pulling going on here that this is uh, not necessarily serious. And I had just happened uh, uh, 40 minutes before all this broke to have been on uh, the English version, English, uh, Iran's English channel press TV. And they were interviewing me about this very thing about the, you know, Israel on the one hand said, Oh, we got, you know, shot him 99% down. And now they're saying, Oh, we got, uh, they hit us at Demona. You know, I, I told them, I said, I wish Israel would make up its mind. It's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde here. You know, it's a dual personality. They got to figure out what they are. Well, we we identify as attacked, <laughs> or, or we identify as being attacked. Now, um, so I was back on, you know, uh, texting back and forth with one of the correspondents on press TV. And they were like sort of scratching their heads saying, yeah, well, let's, we're, what we're hearing is just drones and that they're all shot down. Well, I'm thinking that's a far cry from missile strikes and uh, aircraft screaming overhead. And 
yet at that point you could compare the contract compare and contrast U.S. media, oh my God, this is an attack. This is, you know, it's ramping it up, hyping it up, jumping around. And then I'm watching Al Jazeera and switching over to RT, as well as Press TV. And they're all like, yeah, this, there's, there's reports, but they weren't making a big deal about it. So I, I'm looking at this, and because of the nature of the attack, apparently it was very small, small four very small drones that were shot out of the sky. And even if they had hit the base, it wouldn't have done much damage at all. And, you know, let me to believe that this may very well have been an intelligence operation, U.S. backed and supported, designed to create this narrative of, oh, man, Israel has now struck back. Yeah, they've got the revenge, so let's move on you know, to sort of defuse the need, the demands here. Now, it doesn't take the pressure off of BB and Israel. Because in Israel, a lot of people saw through the smoke screen going, even, you know, Ithamar ben Gavir, that was lame. You know, the, the, that was weak. Uh, they, they, you know, they're expecting a, you know, big boom and they didn't get anything. Uh, you know, not much happened. Now, I want, you can compare and contrast Israel's response when it was bombed by the uh, Iranian missiles and Iran's response to this Israeli attack. Um, yesterday, Iran, within within an hour, hour and a half of that attack, you could find on social media, on Telegram, live footage from the military base outside of Isfahan that was supposedly hit. They got dudes standing, you know, the air, anti-aircraft defense gun is up there. They're up there just, you know, chatting, looking around, wiping the sleep from their eyes. You know, it was still early morning. Nobody running around, no sirens blaring, no smoke going off. No, but they showed it. Here we are five days after the attack on the Israeli air bases that didn't cause any damage. It didn't do anything. You're not seeing any videotape from there. They didn't take their news crews out there. Yeah, let us show you what a crock of crap this was from Iran. Nothing, nothing, Burger. Take care. Come on, guys. Film it. They didn't do that. They used some old stock footage, and some of it looks like it had been doctored. So that tells me that uh, Iran actually hit the targets and hit it with something. Uh, but right now, uh, I think Iran's position is quite clear. If Israel really does attack them and attack in force against Iranian assets, Iran will retaliate. And I think Israel is now starting to have to take that on board as uh, planning consideration. What, what do they actually want to do? You know, they clearly didn't think through the implications of hitting the uh, Iranian uh, annex at their embassy in Damascus. Yeah, it was, it was sort of, again, if, if this didn't involve such tragic loss of life and such you know, devastating human carnage, the Israeli ambassador, a guy named Gildad, I mean, he is a, he's a genuine Neanderthal, but he was on complaining about bringing on the Palestinians as a <clears throat> full-fledged member of NATO would be a violation of international law. I'm going, good God, man, look at a mirror. You guys violate international law every other day with impunity. I mean, hell, forget about blowing up the annex. What about just bombing inside Syria and uh, Iraq, for God's sake, and Lebanon? Those are attacks, full-fledged attacks on other countries. No matter how you want to excuse it all, oh, well, we were going after terrorist targets. You know, terrorism has become the biggest excuse to uh, go out and violate international law that we've ever had. Um, so, and then, you know, they, they completely ignore the resolutions passed by the Security Council calling for an immediate ceasefire. So, you know, I don't want to hear a word about international law from Israel other than, okay, we're going to obey it. 
uh, you know, they just follow it when it's convenient for them. If Ben Gavir is not happy with this attack on Iran, do you think that Israelis are considering a continuous attack on Iran? Uh, at this point, no. I think whatever has been done behind the scenes with the United States and with the Russians and with the Chinese, uh, I think the Russians weighed in with the Israelis just letting them know you launch any attacks against nuclear facilities or do, to attempt to use any kind of nuclear weapons uh, against Iran, you're going to have you're going to be dealing with us. Just understand what you're up against. So, <clears throat> I think Netanyahu got that message loud and clear. Israel's not in a good position. Uh, it is uh, they're you know they they're continuing to kill Palestinian civilians right and left. Uh, but it, they are, it looks like, going to try to attack in Rafa. Means to be seen if they act on their vow to go into uh, southern Lebanon. They've been promising to do so, and they've been stepping up some of their air operations there. But uh, by the same token, so Hezbollah has been responding with increased uh, intensity and ferocity. Do we know how capable is Hezbollah if something happens between Israel and Hezbollah? How much missiles and what kind of missiles do they have? I don't know what their full inventory of missiles are, <laughs> but they certainly, um, if we go back and compare to 2006, the last time Israel invaded in force into southern Lebanon to take on Hez Hezbollah, Israel essentially, they lost that. So... I would argue that today Hezbollah is far stronger, more capable, more lethal than it was in 2006. There's no evidence that Israel is more capable, more lethal, more competent. So I, I think Hezbollah is actually in a position to do a lot of damage to the Israelis if they dare to enter southern Lebanon. Do you see any sign of the Netanyahu administration getting so desperate to consider any sort of nuclear bombs. You know, I know that's always in the back of everybody's mind as a possible scenario. But then you have to ask, where are they going to use them? They're not going to use them inside Israel itself uh, for fear of contaminating them, uh, their own people and sacred sites. Do Would they do it in Lebanon? You know, if, if any any use of a nuke by Israel is going to elicit a response, uh, countries as far away as Pakistan have vowed that they will use their nuclear weapons against Israel if Israel does something like that. Promise to supply them to Turkey as an example. Uh, so, you know that Israel. It's one of these arguments that, well, if Israel's survival is at stake, they're going to use it, which if they use it, it's going to mean their own loss of life and end of their country anyway. So it's it's a it's a suicide. It's like the, the gift to a suicide bomber. But how about Iran? Or do you th do you see any possibility or any likelihood to attack <clears throat> Iran with nuclear bombs? Uh, no, the. the you know, the intelligence community has been pretty insistent that Iran uh, has not had stopped working on a nuclear device back in 2002. Uh, you know, I, I have no reason to doubt that, except, uh, you know, I look at the, the competence of Iranian scientists and engineers. They're quite capable of building a bomb. They've already developed the missile technology for delivering such a bomb. So building that bomb itself is not uh, a mission impossible by any stretch. Uh, I think Iran is content at this moment that it can handle Israel with just its conventional forces alone, which are pretty robust and, and deep. But uh, this, you know, this whole bugaboo about Iran trying to get uh, nuclear weapons. The only reason they've tried to get nuclear weapons is they're they they look around the region. Every nation that has nukes doesn't face the threat of an invasion. 
Uh, the nations that don't, they get invaded. The regimes get overthrown. So you look at that and go, maybe we ought to have nukes just to protect ourselves. When we look at this attack on Iran, there was no comparison between what's going on in Iran because I was following what's going on in Iran and what's going on in the United <laughs> States in, yeah. on CNN, on Fox News. It, they were talking the way that it's huge. They were attacking Iran hugely and they were yeah. bombing everything. It They've was wiped something out. like the a Air real Fo war. <laughs> yeah, the Air Force has been wiped out. Oh my God, the, now the nuclear plants are leveled. Oh, <laughs> I'm going, what? It's just, you know, if that was true, we would see the images of it without without a doubt. And uh, we weren't seeing the images. Uh, you know, it just, but it, it that's what, it shows the desperation of the West to create this narrative that is so divorced from reality. You have to, you know, scratch your head and say, why, why are they doing this? Why are they acting this way? Um, and so the, I again, I came to the conclusion part of this was to create political, uh, to help construct a political narrative in the United States that, yeah, we backed Israel and uh, Israel has now retaliated against Iran and Iran's back in the box. And we win. Look at all the great stuff we did. Uh, that plays well with the Jewish voters. That plays well with the conservative Christians who are. A lot of evangelicals are ardent supporters of Israel. But I'm not sure that does Joe Biden any benefit with his uh, Arab American, Muslim American supporters. And uh, be, because they want Genocide Joe to stop being Genocide Joe. And they want him to stop in, you know, engaging in battles with other both Muslims and Arabs and Persians uh, in the Middle East. In Iran, when they're talking about this attack, it seems that they didn't find it a big deal. But yeah. when, what, but when, when we see what's going on with Netanyahu and his administration in Israel, it's a big deal for him because they wanted his administration, many of people who are far right in his administration, they really wanted to attack Iran. They really, right, right. they were insisting to attack Iran. And it seems to me that the Biden administration and the Netanyahu administration came to a conclusion that we're going to attack Iran with some drones and you're going to just publish it immensely in the media to show that it was a big deal. Yeah. Uh, that that's what leads me to that. That's what I started out by saying. I think this was an intel operation directed primarily at the United States and the United States public, because the information on it was coming out here before it was coming out over there. Number one, and the access that was given to certain reporters like Jennifer Griffiths and others. Oh yeah, here look. People in the Pentagon, we'll give you the inside scoop. Here's what happened. And it turns out it was bullshit. I mean, what they were saying happened and didn't happen. There weren't missiles. They were these, you know, basically almost children's toys used to launch this attack. And, and, and it, but it was just the intensity of it and the, the volume was turned way up here. And that wasn't the case over there. It wasn't even the case in, this was not a case of Iranian mullahs trying to suppress information. This was a genuine case of, what the hell are these people talking about? What attacks? Because it's not even clear that uh, air defense missiles were used in uh, Iran to shoot these things down. It sounds like ground-based units shooting uh, you know, 50 caliber rounds may have downed it. Or maybe a shotgun shell. Who knows? Just, but but once you saw that kind of manipulation taking place, you knew that this, this was about something else. There was something else going on here. Larry, the other issue would be how people in Turkey, in these Arab states, would think of their leaders. We know that in Turkey, Erdogan was talking so 
aggressively toward Netanyahu okay, right. and his administration all since this conflict started in Gaza, but he didn't do anything. Right now, when Iran attack Israel this way, just to show how how they can react to any sort of attack on the part of Israel, how do they how how do the people in Turkey would think of Erdogan in your opinion? <laughs> because they wanted this from Erdogan. Yeah. They wanted this. I, I think there's a growing um backlash against Erdogan. Uh, you know, the recent uh, municipal election about held a month ago, he suffered major loss. Uh, and so since then he's been at, back out with his, you know, gums flapping about, oh boy, the the these these Israelis are bad as Hitler. What are you going to do about it? You got you going to cut off the oil flow there, Tasif? Oh no, 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 can't do that. Uh, it's money, money in my pocket, money in the pocket of my children. So just as long as you know where your priorities stand, take care of you first, and screw off the to Palestine. Yeah, it just uh, I think the the Iranian action bought them a lot of credibility and support even among Sunni populations that normally are not well disposed towards their uh, Iranian Shia counterparts. We know that in this conflict, it seems that Jordan and Egypt and also Saudi Arabia and UAE have provided some intelligence to the United States and, and the United Kingdom, France and how 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 do you see this combination of these Arab states together with the United States? How do they feel right now after this attack, after the results coming out? And how how do you see the their point of view right now comparing to what it was before attack this attack of Iranian Iranian attack on Israel? Well, I think they're they're trying to keep things calm, keep a lid on everything, then not have it blow up. Um and and they they face you know they they're being torn in two directions. On the one hand, most of their populations, the you know the average guy a gal in the street, they fully firmly support Palestine and want to see their leaders do something about it. Uh, but when you get the people like uh, CC and in Egypt and MBS in Saudi Arabia. They end up having sometimes a different set of priorities than their quote loyal subjects. So they will pursue the, sometimes they'll pursue interests that pertain to economics and things that benefit them individually or as families. So it's a real uh, it, if if we start seeing images of Iran being attacked itself and civilian casualties in any size, then at that point, you're going to see uh, Iran really come back and, and go after Israel. Israel up to this now point, I think he's got lucky because uh, th this was a token, I call it a token attack, the first one. Yeah, 300, you know, over 125 drones and, you know, 80, 90 uh, cruise missiles and another 100 and 510 uh, ballistic missiles you know it, but that what that was only a fraction of what uh Iran has you know if they step up to the plate they could potentially what they showed is they could overwhelm uh the western defenses and the west couldn't do anything about it and I, that may have been the Iranians were, you know may have gone Oh my, oh my God, or I guess it's say, oh my Allah, you know, <laughs> look, look at what we we can do. I mean, you start thinking creatively, hell, uh, can they, can Iran produce a thousand drones? You bet you they can. The starting point of this conflict was that attack on Iranian consulate in Syria. Right. And... My biggest doubt is why they did attack the Iranian consulate. Here comes the, the answer to this question. Do you think they were wishing to bring in the United States 
because they they thought that Iran after this attack Iran would attack them viciously, and they that attack can bring the United States into the conflict. One of the and and on the other hand, they were trying to distract the attention on Gaza and what's what's going on in Gaza in Rafa, this starvation, these problems, this dire situation that right. we are witnessing right now. What was the main goal of the Netanyahu administration? Well, I can't. I can't. Lay, I don't know. I think you've laid out some sound possibilities. That you know, it could have been a simple. A, we've been tracking these Iranian uh, IRGC guys for a while. We've got them identified. We we we, we want to take them out without you know just just to show that we can, without thinking through another step. What does that mean? We take them out. Is Iran going to retaliate? Where are we going to hit them? If we hit them, you know, maybe they weren't, th they didn't think through those secondary and tertiary effects. That's one possibility. Or maybe they say, look, we're in a tough bind. Things aren't going well for us in Gaza. We've got the pressure from the north, from Hezbollah. Maybe if we attack and uh, attack Iran in this way, it's going to force Iran's hand that they will have to attack us. And then the United States would come to our defense. Not counting on the possibility that the Biden administration says, whoa, 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 wait a second. We're not about to get involved with another shooting war with you. No, no, back off. So, you know, both are credible, uh, you know, hypotheses. Uh, we'll, we'll just, we, I don't know if we'll ever know. All we can do is look at what has the effect been. So regardless of what the motive was, regardless of what the plan was, what has the effect been? Uh, in doing that, Israel created a motivation for Iran for the first time ever to carry out military strikes inside Israel, and they demonstrated the ability to do it. And it exposed Israel's inability to stop ballistic missile attacks completely. Uh, well. I think that's pretty significant. It also uh, gave Iran critical intelligence on the location of Israeli air defense systems and what their capabilities were. Yeah, because they used uh, using drones and they weren't using even their most advanced cruise missiles. So it was like bait. Put it out there, let the Israelis shoot it up, let the Americans shoot it up, and we'll see you know who's doing what. What percentage were shot down by U.S. aircraft? What percentage were shot down by uh, Israel's land-based system? It would be interesting to know. Were, were most actually because of the uh, Western aircraft that are not under Israeli command? Perhaps. And, and so that, that would be telling. Uh, so just, just when you step back and start looking at the practical aspects of it, it is also now... Uh, created uh, a greater volatility potential for uh, in immediate escalation that if uh, Israel acts in you know recklessly towards Iran, Iran's going to retaliate and can retaliate in a much bigger fashion than it has up to now. Larry, whenever we talk about Netanyahu, Everybody's saying that he is a smart prime minister. So far, he was so smart. But with his, with these, in the last five months, six months, we didn't see any smart decision on his part. Failure after failure. We, we, this attack in in Gaza. This everybody's against Israel right now, all over the world. Right, right now, there was a red line of not attacking Israel directly from Iran Iranians. Right now, that red line has gone. Yeah. And yeah. How, how this guy, how we can call this guy smart when he did each and every failure that he could he could have done to Israel, he has done already. Well, it's, uh, I will liken it. So when I, when I teach people for carrying a concealed firearm, and if they ever have to use it, there's a phenomena that takes place that when people are engaged with the shooting, they get 
tunnel vision. So their vision, instead of seeing everything broadly, it narrows in, get very narrow. And then you get auditory exclusion where you, you lose the awareness of sounds around you. You're actually not hearing anything. That's what happened, I think, to BB Net. You know, they got so fixated upon what happened on October 7th. They lost sight of everything else. And they weren't looking at it big picture. They weren't looking at it as a dynamic process. They just got focused. Oh my God, we got we got to respond. We got to punish. We got to kill Hamas. And when that becomes your dominant thinking, you're not aware of what's going on around you. Or you're not aware of how this may impact your relations with all these other states and nations. You know, it's it's really if you've I don't know if you've taken time to watch in the UN Security Council debates, but the, the this guy who's the the Israel's ambassador to the UN, good lord, what a thug clown he is! I mean, he's he's like triumph the insult dog. He is insulting everybody. Calling there, you know, Russia. Hey, you're a terrorist state. Hey, Secretary General, you know, eat this and up your, you know, it's just like this guy has. No sense of decorum. And you think it's a good strategy to piss on everybody around that table? I don't. That's, you know, the, the art of winning friends and in influencing enemies is that you got to have a dialogue and got to find some way to reach out and persuade them. Boy, he's no, no persuasion on his part. It's just he's basically given the UN Security Council, the middle finger repeatedly over and over and over. 